Congresswoman Crockett, is so interesting saying that officially right now. <laughs> so you're like two weeks into the job officially. How are you feeling right now? Um, I'm feeling encouraged. Um, you know, what we saw that first week, the chaos, um, I absolutely believe that that's going to be an ongoing theme uh, in the U.S. House. And so long as the chaos stays across the aisle, I think that that does so much for us as we look to take the House back, as we look to maintain our control of the U.S. Senate, and as we look to hopefully maintain uh, our place in the White House. So, yeah, I'm feeling pretty encouraged. <laughs> Since you mentioned the chaos, let's talk about that. It wasn't even your first official day. You were waiting patiently f to be sworn in, and we saw how that chaos and drama played out. Fifteen rounds. Yeah. Was that surprising to you? It was. It was. I absolutely thought that they would get it figured out a lot quicker. Um, and I'm used to working in a legislative body where whoever is controlling, whether it's a committee hearing or controlling the floor, they usually know how this is going to go. They've done their count, they've whipped their votes, and they don't bring it until they're ready. And so, um, you know, initially we knew that McCarthy did not have the votes, so I fully anticipated after that first vote that things would fall and he would evaluate and he would recalibrate. Um, but I did not see him texting vigorously. I did not see him walking and working the floor. So I was thinking, well, this isn't good because it seems like we're about to do the insane thing, right? Like just continue to do the same thing over and over, expecting a different result. And it, it went 15 rounds. And almost got, well, physical. Oh, definitely. Did you see that play out? Oh, I did. I was sitting. So what most people don't realize is when we say across the aisle, the way that they tell you to sit in the U.S. House is if you're a Democrat, you sit on the left. If you're a Republican, you sit on the right. In the center aisle, that is what we say when we say reaching across the aisle. And so I was sitting um, at the center aisle on the left side, and this altercation occurred in the center aisle um, just a little bit back from me. So, yeah, I, I definitely saw the drama unfold, and I think uh, America was happy that C-SPAN had cameras that could roam. Uh, and see everything because normally they are limited. They are not allowed to roam around, um, and now they're not allowed to roam around because we have a speaker. It was so eye-opening to many of us who were watching it all play out into the wee hours of the morning. You guys didn't get sworn in until almost 2 o'clock. Yeah. That was a long day. Yeah, it was a very long day, and, um, you know, we were sitting there with bated breath. Right? Like, is it going to happen? Is it not going to happen? Because we weren't privy to the conversations. We had been told that it was going to happen, and then McCarthy lost by one vote. Yeah. And then they decided that we were going to recess until Monday. And uh, the Democrats basically wanted to say, hey, listen, we were sent here, we were sent here to work, and we can't do anything, not to mention one of the things we did not talk about a lot was the fact that this was literally a threat to national security. Congress is the body that will definitely decide whether or not we go into war. So what it was is those that had been a, members of the 117th, they were done. And the 118th didn't have anybody that could be read in on anything because we weren't sworn in. And so we were in a very vulnerable state and we did not want to um, alarm the general public but we needed to get this done. And not being able to be privy to any classified documents? Or Absolutely. We could not do anything. We could not function. And so with that, we were saying, no, we don't want to recess. Um, and they were saying, yes, 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 recess, because they didn't have the votes. And finally, someone was able to turn Matt Gates. And so then they started all changing their votes. But once again, the Democrats saved them yeah. again on that. And it seemed like your party was pretty toned on Hakeem Jeffries. We were unified. We were unified behind Hakeem and, you know, too bad we didn't have a few courageous uh, moderate Republicans that wanted to just come on over to our side um, so that we could get to the people's work. But, you know, one thing that we wanted to make clear is that we weren't here to play and we're not here to play. Um, unfortunately, we're going to see a lot of political theater out of this side and unfortunately they seemingly don't care about how much damage comes to the American people um, so long as they feel like it's going to help them in their very Republican primaries. Talking about not being here to play, that was one of your campaign promises that you would hit the ground running and from what we've seen you have. Yeah. Um, you haven't slowed down one <laughs> bit already um, elected to some leadership positions. Yeah, so um, <laughs> 
It has been crazy. But Shirley Chisholm was the first black woman who was ever sworn into Congress. And it's been since she was sworn into Congress that a black woman has sat at the House Democratic Caucus leadership table. Um, myself and Lauren Underwood are now the first two black women in this session since Shirley Chisholm to have seats at that table. So I'm the first black woman to serve as the freshman rep to leadership. Um, that role encompasses me doing everything that I can to advocate for this class of 34 Democratic freshmen, making sure that they return, as well as increasing our numbers. Um, so it's a political thing as well as a governing thing, making sure that I'm looking out for my classmates, uh, making sure that they're getting committee assignments that were newer to their benefits and make sense for their districts, and being their advocates um, because a lot of times one of the things that I see at, is DC normally wants to cookie cutter campaigns, and I want to get them out of that. Um, my district doesn't look like, say, um, one of my colleagues, Amelia Sykes, who's in Ohio. Um, she's got a little bit more of a rural district. Mm -hmm. Our districts aren't the same. We're both black women, but we got to do this differently. And I want to be that advocate and that voice to make sure that we understand the differences, we appreciate the differences, and we fight um, in a realm that makes sense for each of us 34 freshmen. Already walking into this role, Congresswoman, amid some controversy and what the public may see as a drama, did you expect that? I know you've seen your fair share of it here on the state level, <laughs> but did you expect that in D.C.? Um, I did. Once, once we uh, went into the minority, which we were still like waiting and hoping and praying, there were so many races that did not get called um, half as quickly as mine. Um, and so we were waiting for days and for some weeks um, to find out kind of what is our fate going to be. Lauren Boebert, who is a thorn in America's side, uh, Lauren Boebert won her seat by 500 votes. This was rated a solidly Republican seat. Um, the person that ran against her, Adam Frisch, is someone that the majority of Americans did not even know existed, and he almost took her out. And so we were waiting on those final counts. In fact, Frisch was brought to freshman orientation because nobody knew whether or not he was going to be coming or not, and they didn't want him to be behind. And so um, we did have some very close races that we were waiting for to determine whether or not we were going to be in the majority. Um, knowing that we're in the minority, yeah, I absolutely accept it that it was going to be uh, a lot of gamesmanship. Um, did I anticipate that they would uh, go after Social Security um, and Medicaid and Medicare so vigorously? I did not. Um, I thought, and, and I didn't anticipate they would go after reproductive rights either because one of the reasons that they did not get their red wave is because of the Supreme Court. We know this. Um, so doubling down on dumb to me is, you know, not what they would do, but that's what they've decided to do. I know you're preparing to tackle some controversial issues. I know you've been speaking out recently on the debt limit. Uh, uh, yeah, the ceiling. The yeah. ceiling, yeah. So how much of a distraction is that? Yeah, you know, it's, it's more than just a distraction. Um, it, it can lead to very destructive outcomes, to be perfectly honest. We know that there are three million or more people that um, may have their livelihoods directly impacted because they work for the federal government. If we um, are to shut down, which I fully anticipate is going to happen, we also know that the last time that they really did this type of standoff, that we incurred um, a, a rating decrease. And so for people to better understand, yeah. um, this is like your credit, right? So when you have a credit card, as, as it was recently described, um, you gotta pay your bills. And so if your limit is 20,000, but you need more money for whatever reasons, then you apply to your credit card and say, hey, I need to increase my limit, but I'm gonna keep paying my bills. I'm gonna keep paying on my credit card. And so when we fail to pay our bills, then our credit rating falls, which means that we cannot um, borrow money as easily. That also, as far as I'm concerned, is a national security risk, especially when we see um, the power that China is wielding in the world. We don't need a world where China is the one that is leading um, the entire world. We need to be the leaders that we are. And so we can't afford to have our credit downgraded. We can't afford to um, not pay people um, to go to work. Uh, when anybody goes to work, they expect to get paid. And so it's unfair that someone would think that these government employees 
are nothing more than pawns. Yeah. And that is the problem when we start to put politics over people. Um, we've got to focus in on the people, and that's one of the things that I just feel like the Republicans are incapable of doing. Talking about the people, you're back home this week, yeah. uh, traveling across North Texas. Yeah. What have you been busy doing um, since officially named Congresswoman Crockett and uh, coming back home and talking to the people? What, uh, what have you been doing this week? Yeah, so it's been busy. Um, so definitely we've done lots of parades. Um, so I'm really excited for the kids in the districts. Um, we ended up with three football champions, so I'm very excited for Sock and DeSoto and Duncanville. And so since I've been home, we've had a Duncanville parade. We'll have the DeSoto mm -hmm. parade uh, coming up. So really excited about that. We've done the MLK Day parades in Lancaster and Grand Prairie and Dallas. And so we're definitely trying to make sure every portion of the district knows that I'm here, knows that I'm supportive of them, um, and that I'm accessible. That's one of the things that I think um, made it easier for me to make it over the hump is that I have this track record of being very down to earth and available to the people because as far as I'm concerned, as far as I'm always concerned, the seat belongs to the people. Yeah. And so it's important that I interact. What are people um, telling you right now? I'm sorry? What are the people telling you right now? Um, they're really proud of me. They're really excited. They keep up with everything that's going on. Um, communication is very important. If they don't hear about it, then it didn't happen, which we know isn't true, but like that forms their reality. So they're very excited to see that I stuck with Hakeem Jeffries. I was getting these messages saying, thank you for being there and continuing to vote. So they were paying attention to the fact that I was voting consistently for Hakeem Jeffries to be the speaker. Um, one of the other great things that we did, and I think the community was really excited to see, is I really have been a climate change warrior. That is something that in the State House, um, I was one of the founding members of the Climate Caucus. Um, and so we know that black and brown communities tend to be disproportionately affected by climate injustice. And so the fact that we had a super fun site in District 30, um, right there in the Cedar Crest area, I was able to go and experience the demolition of this particular facility that was very exciting for me. Yeah. It was exciting for me to tell EPA that uh, I have something else on my agenda. Um, and so I'm excited to work with them to make sure that even those communities that maybe others have forgotten or just others disrespected, that they know that they have a champion that is going to say that you deserve to breathe clean air just like other portions of Dallas. Yeah. Are breathing and so those are the things that I'll be fighting for. Let me stick on that for a minute uh, because I think down the line I'll be looking at some environmental uh, discrimination or environmental injustice issues happening around Dallas County. Mm -hmm. uh, saw you at the press conference yesterday for lane plating. Yeah. Happened to be in the same district where folks were dealing with Shingle Mountain yeah. a couple of years ago. We know that in West Dallas neighbors are fighting for yeah. uh, their own environmental um, justice yeah. concerns yeah. Uh, with industry over there. Jobby. Joppy as well, yeah. yeah. Um, we've covered some of those stories too. So it's happening, yeah. just not talked about a lot. Yeah. What do you see as a priority in trying to convince folks like the EPA um, and your colleagues in Congress to take these, cons these uh, matters seriously, especially when it deals with uh, vulnerable communities? Yeah, so what most people don't really realize is, you know, nobody really gets into the nitty gritty of legislation that's a thousand pages long. Mm -hmm. Right, but uh, the Biden-Harris administration did us a solid, to be perfectly honest, when it came to the Infrastructure Act. Um, there are monies for clearing up kind of some of these injustices, monies that are specifically um, to target these areas that have been vulnerable. Um, we know that we've always talked about lead and it being in the plumbing, it being in the paint and it affecting black and brown communities. Um, but we know that it gets deeper than that. Um, as we advance in technology, we learn more and more um, about some of these threats that exist for some of these, like you talk about uh, lane plating, you know, that have been around for 90 years, right? And so the question is how much damage potentially was done? How much can be specifically tied to lane plating? We know that it's definitely a problem, right? But like how far outside of its borders did it go? And so, um, you know, the EPA moved at record speed, um, but they took all the tools that were in their toolbox to get it done. And so having an administration 
that will make sure that the monies are there is really important. So I know when people think about voting for president, this isn't really one of those things is at the top of the list or even when they're thinking about voting for their next congressional member. But these are the things that we need to think about. Who will invest in making sure that we have clean air, clean water, um, and clean energy overall, right? And who won't? Um, so, you know, these are things that we'll be pushing for. These are things that, yes, we're continuing to see. I think that there are probably environmental injustice issues that we still have not uncovered um, in District 30. But in the southern sector, this is where all of these places are, right? Um, West Dallas isn't considered the southern sector, but it is a part of District 30. Yeah. Um, and so this is a matter of making sure that elected officials on every single level are engaged. And so the community has to speak up and speak out uh, about what it is that they're experiencing. And so I started working on the GAF issue in the state house. Um, I made sure that the people in the community could have a hearing. Um, so that there could be a record because they get to argue when they're going up for their renewal of their licensing they get to say hey nobody's against us if it's not on record right and so going through and educating those advocacy organizations this is what we need to do to really move the needle and it seems like the needle is being moved with GAF um, in West Dallas um, and, and that's exciting the question is what do we do next right if once they're gone what happens? Because we know that that soil most likely is very much contaminated. Um, we don't want children playing it. So, so then that's when I come in on the federal level and say, hey, EPA, what do y'all need from me? And I go and find those monies to make sure that we can clean up that site. Thanks for that perspective. You mentioned a moment ago investment. I know that you have also been visiting some businesses uh, during your yeah. campaign. You talked about uh, businesses investing. We know that Southwest is one of the places you yeah. visited even after their hiccup uh, a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if I would call it a hiccup, but yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so what are they telling you? You know, it was, you learn? It, it was definitely interesting. I, I do want people to know that when there is a meltdown uh, of this level, and even though I had not been sworn in, I was, I was briefed. Um, and so we were on Zoom calls. We were having calls with um, various perspectives. So we talked to the Pilots Association. We also talked to representatives from the corporation. So we, we also talked to some other unions, right? So we wanted everybody's perspective on what was going on so that we could ascertain kind of, okay, what do we think is really happening? Um, so it was a deep dive. They took me into their situation room um, so that I could see. They were explaining to me all the different boards, like what it is that we're looking at. Um, and on the particular day that I went to visit Southwest, we were talking about uh, a weather event that was planned to happen in Denver and the disruptions. And so they were going through kind of what that process looked like. Mm -hmm. We also looked at uh, how they train people. It was really fascinating. So, I mean, I always get on the Southwest plan because it's the most convenient, it's easy for me. Um, but to know the level of training that they have invested in, I'm like, oh, okay, you know. I should never crash. Um, this is great. Uh, they definitely instilled that confidence. But I was also concerned about staffing. So staffing seemingly was the really big issue, like a big crux of the issue in this meltdown. Um, because unlike uh, a Delta Airlines or American Airlines, where they basically have basic hubs, they have the majority of their staff in a few places. So if something goes wrong, most of their flights were going there, most of their flights are there, they have extra. Um, because they do it that way. Most people fly Southwest because they just want a quick nonstop somewhere um, because they do a point-to-point -point service. But what happened is when there was a breakdown, they had staff that were stuck in places that they weren't supposed to be in. And seemingly they were not able to really evaluate where is everyone. Um, there was an overload on their systems as they were trying to call in and find out where they were. One of the things that we heard is that they really were operating on the margins as far as staffing, so I asked them about that. They pushed back a little bit and, bit and said, no, we weren't. Um, but I, I know that we have shortage issues in the industry, yeah. period. So I made sure to ask those questions. What are you doing to plan for the upcoming retirements when it comes to things like pilots? Um, we know that pilots have an expiration date from a safety perspective. Mm -hmm. So at the age of 65, you're done. You're not allowed to fly anymore. So it's like, all right, what are we doing? Because now kids are, 
you know, more so studying social media and things like that because you can make money that way. Yeah. So what are we doing to introduce this? So, you know, I wanted to talk to them about potential programming and, and putting things into schools, especially in black and brown communities, because unfortunately, um, you know, in fact, there was a class of incoming pilots that was there as I was leaving. I didn't see one black person. That's unfortunate, yeah. um, and we've got to do better. So we talked. Um, they made sure I sat down with their um, DNI person, um, and so you know I had suggestions and thoughts. Obviously, I'm federal government, so I don't get to dictate very much of anything to a private corporation. Um, but it is my job to talk to them about what it is that I, I expect, yeah. especially since Southwest is housed in a majority minority district. And especially what, you, and what you've experienced as well. Yeah. I mean, District 30 has so many schools that are emerging with STEM programs. Yeah. There seems to be plenty of possibility and Absolutely. potential for those too. Absolutely. So uh, we appreciate you bringing that up to their attention. Yeah. Um, as we begin to wrap up, I wanted to ask you too about um, what are you most optimistic about? Hmm. Um, 2024. <laughs> I'm just trying to get past this session. Um, you know, I think the elections in 24 will uh, do us some good. I mean, that's, and, and probably from a more practical standpoint, um, honestly, just the people, yeah. really. I mean, the people is what drove me to want to do this job anyway. And it's really exciting for them to be so proud of me and to follow my journey. Um, and so for me, it, it's a matter of, you know, what can I do to encourage the next generation? Um, I think that I probably have, on average, the youngest staff uh, in Congress. I've got um, two 20-year-olds and one 21-year-old that are full-time staffers in D.C. Um, they have their college degrees, and this is their first real job post-college. Um, I'm excited for the future. That's what I'm excited for. I've kind of given up on, on certain people. Um, you know, those that are kind of leading our country in the wrong direction, but uh, this new generation seems to be awake and alive and really wanting to do any and everything that they can to fight for a better future. So I'm optimistic um, because of the young people, and I am here to make sure that I can provide a, a pathway for them, and I'm also here to make sure that I can do everything to honor our seniors. Um, you know, I think it's mad disrespectful. Um, to even think that you would touch Social Security. That's just the bottom line. We know that we're talking about the people that have really built this country and made it go. Those are the people we're talking about affecting. And so um, I'm excited to be their champion um, and never give up fighting for what they deserve. Um, and that also includes access to health care. You know, in the state of Texas, we suck. <laughs> I mean, that's just the, that there's no other way. There's no fancy way to put it. We suck when it comes to access to affordable health care or health care at all. Um, the fact is we have more uninsured than any other state in this country, and that is a shame. To say that we're economic leaders, to say that we have this amazing surplus, a surplus that no other state has when it comes to the budget, but when it comes to the people, what are we doing? Yeah. We're not using that money to take care of the people, clearly, and the people is what make Texas great. Um, so, you know, the opportunity to continue to fight for people every single day um, gives me hope. Are there any hot issues in Texas right now that you think will carry over to your work? Um, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, immigration, I'm sure. Any others? Uh, definitely voting rights. I mean, that's where most people kind of um, saw me on the national stage. Yeah. Um, so I absolutely think that there's some shotgun bills that I can push for. Um, that may make it, such as online voter registration. We have federal legislation that requires online voter registration when you're renewing your license or your ID or if you're getting a replacement. And so we know that Texas has the infrastructure. We know that there are, um, you know, Republican and Democratic states that have this. And because of how um, inconvenient it can be in a state that is as vast as Texas, this is something that can really do good for us. So that's one of the shotgun things that I want to push for. But, you know, I won my um, primary runoff on the same day as the Uvalde shooting. I will never forget that. Um, I will never forget May 24. And so I think it's incumbent upon me as a Texan who is licensed to carry, even though there's no requirement to get a license anymore, 
um, that we get smart about how we're going to save lives because we lead in mass shootings. Um, and so I am looking at legislation that will hopefully expand the authority of Homeland Security um, to deal with those that are making threats online. Online is federal territory. Um, and we know that even when we look at the Uvalde shooter, he was called the school shooter before he ever effectuated this plan because he was literally online making threats. He was talking about it. And so, you know, I want to see what we can do to hopefully um, bring about legislation that will expand their authority so that Homeland Security, who should be equipped to deal with these types of threats, um, can go after some folk and save lives. Because even if we change the legislation tomorrow and say, hey, no more assault rifles, that doesn't mean that they automatically disappear off the streets. Yeah. But how do we save lives? And I think this is one of the ways we can. We know this been it's already been an interesting start to this legislative session for you and your freshman colleagues. Mm -hmm. And uh, can't help but to mention that uh, seems to be the background and history of Mr. George Santos <laughs> tends to be something that's a distraction. Do you think that's going to continue to be a distraction, or how are you and your colleagues uh, maneuvering this? Um, I, you know, I think that we're maneuvering this by using Santos as a a pressure point for the Republicans, um, really making it clear that they have no bottom. You know, it's all about winning. It's all about power. That's it. Um, that they're lacking in common decency. And I think it's setting us up for the next, you know, next two years, um, the next session. It's setting us up to win because the Republicans want to distance themselves, but they need his vote, right? And so I think that this is about decency and where do we draw the line? Um, and honestly, we know that the decent Republicans, um, they're gone. We know that an Adam Kinzinger, we know that a Liz Cheney probably would have been the two that would have said, this is wrong. Um, but we know that the MAGA faction of the Republican Party seemingly is lacking in the courage to just say certain things are right and certain things are wrong. So I think that we need to tie them to Santos as much as we can, just like we tied them to Donald Trump. Um, because they don't have our best interests at heart, and people need to be reminded of that. As soon as they are trying to make a decision on if I'm voting for the Democrat or the Republican, they need to be reminded of the foolishness that comes with the Republican Party. Congresswoman, my last question for you this morning. <laughs> what message, if any, do you have for the residents across Texas District 30 right now? Um, I just want them to know that I'll be fighting every single day. Um, I think that they put me into this seat because I had a proven track record of being a fighter. Um, but beyond fighting, um, we're going to have measurable deliverables. You know, one of the things I was excited about is that the Republicans agreed to keep community project investments. This means that there will be an opportunity for me to bring actual dollars into the community um, and make sure that they are directly given to the people of this district. So it doesn't end up in a situation of Democrats versus Republicans and only the Republicans will get this money. No, we all will get some real deliverables and be able to impact the community directly. And so the Congresswoman was able to walk out um, and in her term on a very high note, she was able to bring a lot of money directly to District 30. I plan to do the same. One of the things that she was able to do is get almost $8 million for the deck park. Um, and so we're going to keep fighting. So if there are monies that people believe uh, could be well spent on some projects that they really want to see come to fruition, I encourage them to reach out to our office. But there will be dollars, direct dollars, that they can feel, they can see. And I'll make sure that they know where those dollars are going. Uh, one of the areas that I'm specifically looking at is for unhoused people. We have um, a record number of unhoused people in our district. Um, we lead, unfortunately, in the state when it comes to unhoused people. And so I want to see, you know, what monies are needed right now to try to help with that population. I think that that promotes safety for our communities, um, and it also promotes dignity um, for our unhoused people. So, you know, these are the things that I'll be looking at, but I encourage those in the district to reach out, um, and we will work on some projects that we feel like will benefit the district. Congresswoman Jasmine Crockett, we know you're a very busy woman right now. We appreciate your time and perspective. Thank you, Thank you so, so much. much.